Please welcome to the, second, the third session of this uh, intensive conference. Uh, we're going to have four papers this morning. First, Francesca Santedeschi and then Stefan Digov. Then we're going to have a break. Uh, given the fact that Professor Dirov has to leave immediately after the end of the morning session, we're going to do uh, what, we are, what we are going to do is just to have a joint discussion of the two first papers before the break. And then we are going to have Balash and Lawrence and Tim. 15 more minutes, joint discussion of the two last papers, right? So uh, let me introduce you briefly, Mrs. Well, Dr. Francesca Santedeschi. Francesca Santedeschi has studied at the University of Venice, and then she did her PhD at the European University Institute of Florence, so is a member of the Florentine Mafia, which is here very well represented. And uh, she has a second PhD from the University Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. Yeah. She has specialized in the field of micro-nationalism, small regionalist movements, which hardly have made the step towards uh, full-fledged nationalists from phase A to phase B, yeah. to put it in broken terms. In her Florence thesis, which has been published in French, yeah. She studied the Occitanian or Occitan movement. Mm -hmm. In her Barcelona thesis, she has written, I guess, in English. Yeah. She has studied the Northern Catalan movement, or if you want, the uh, Russian Catalan regionalism. So it is my pleasure to have you here on board. And this floor is yours. Grazie mille. Per <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. I'm enjoying very much this Congress. It's wonderful to be here. And good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning, I am talking about micronationalism in Western Europe in the wake, in wake of uh, World War I. Thank you. Uh, the main purposes of my um, presentation of my paper are two. Um, the first one, uh, to present to um, the first, uh, um, the immediate repercussions of the uh, principle of self-determination uh, in some territories of Western Europe. In this case, I will deal with the cases of um, um, Occitania, Roussillon, Brittany, and the French Frandes in France, Wallonia in Belgium, and Austria in Italy. And uh, the second purpose is not uh, sta explicitly stated in, in my paper, but uh, I would like to add uh, an element to the eternal debate uh, on the differences between regionalism, uh, peripher peripheral nationalism, or micro-nationalism. Uh, yesterday we talked about defensive nationalism, and so, and to question, uh, uh, even to question the, uh, the, the term I, I'm using, and that is the term of micronationalities. And so let's start. Yeah. In Europe, where the majority of states were multinational, the idea of self determination was capable. Uh, in Europe, where the majority of states were multinational, the ideal of self-determination was capable of satisfying the most coveted and dependent aspirations of all the stateless national peoples. It gained further legitimacy among the liberal, liberal, uh, liberal public opinion of Western Europe watching over the aspirations of the micro-nationalities of Central and Eastern Europe and consider them as a democratic revolt against tyranny. Nevertheless, the acceptance of the right of a people to self-determination by the powers of the Triple Entente was by no means unanimous, given both the re reluctance to intervene in the uh, internal affairs of a sovereign state and the discontent of national minorities in free of them. 
Moreover, the independentist ambitions of certain peoples, for example, the Poles or the Magyars, were in an arbitrary way given more consideration than others, for example, the Ruthenian and the Slovaks. Likewise, the principle of self-determination was used to justify the remake of the territorial map of the Central and Eastern Europe, where new boundaries were delineated according to ethnic criteria, in the territories of the Allies, on the contrary, there had never been any such intention. According to the British historian, uh, historian Eric J. Obsbaum, among the unexpected consequences of the Wilsonian system, there was the ambiguity of the national idea. Since there was not always any genuine corresp correspondence between the idea advocated by its official proponents and the actual self-identification of the people concerned, as was later demonstrated by numerous plebiscites organized from 1918 on. Moreover, whilst the principle of self-determination had been highly valued until then by nationalist unific unification movements at the expense of multinational states, from 1919 it impugned the very essence of national states, thus becoming source of legitimacy for separatist movements. In this paper, I will address the issue of the immediate repercussions of the 14 points on micronationalisms in Western Europe. Before presenting some case studies, I would like to specify what I mean by the term micronationalisms. Uh, according to Michael Keating's definition, micronationalism can be equated to the French term micronationalité ou petit nation used to distinguish sub-state nationalities from the overarching and predominant nationality of nation states. In the context of this paper, however, I would suggest extending this definition to incorporate the additional element of cultural micronationalisms, insofar as they are, are predominantly cultural and not political, even though at times they lead climb to minor political ambitions. Indeed, after the war, several micronationalities became entangled with a dual cultural and political agenda. In France, I have chosen the cases of Roussillon and French Flanders because they experienced very contrasting uh, situation during the war. In fact, whereas Roussillon was quite distant from the battlefront, because it's in the south, French Flanders bordered on the German-occupied territories. Moreover, they bordered with the territories that shared similar cultural heritage and traditions, Catalonia and Flemish Belgium respectively, which underwent a radicalization process due to the, poli uh, due to the pol politicization of nationalist claims after the war. Uh, I also deal with uh, Brittany and Occitania. Uh, outside France, I have examined the case of uh, Wallos in Belgium and Austria Valley in Italy as further basis for comparative analysis. Um, pop, pop, pop. Okay. Roussillon. <clears throat> uh, in Roussillon, the year before uh, World War I, were characterized by pervading cultural regionalism and the growing debate over the administrative decentralization of France. Uh, in June 1906, the Société d'Etudes de Catalan was created in Perpignan. It was um, a Société Savant, uh, I mean, um, a learned uh, association. Who, which was interested in, in the language, literature, art, and history of the Catalan countries, as well uh, also uh, to preserve everything characterizing the spirit and physiognomy of, the, of these countries. Uh, one of the founding fathers, uh, the founding members of uh, the Société de Tutti Catalan was Jean Amad, who in uh, 1912 published uh, L'idée Régionaliste, and uh, where it championed the urgent need to embark on a process of administrative, administrative and electoral reform. His regionalist theory echoed the ideas of Jean Charles Brun, the founder of Fédération Régionaliste Française, founded in 1901. The Fédération uh, Régionaliste Française aimed to bring together the numerous proponents of decentralization, as well as regionalists and federalists, irrespective of their political or religious convictions. The central point of the convergence am among regionalists was the wealth of the French homeland needed to be generated from radical reform of the organization of the state. <coughs> In Roussillon, Catalan consciousness rising had been deeply marked and, influ and influenced by its relationship with the Catalans on the other side of the Pyrenees. 
this relationship had started in the 19th century when the Catalan cultural and linguistic revival was set in motion. In 1915, the collaboration between the two sides of Pyrenees increased significantly. In April, Catalan nationalists engaged in fervent international activity, aiming to raise awareness of their cause among foreign public opinion. We, we talked about this uh, yesterday also. In particular, some Catalan nationalists embarked on a propaganda campaign over the presence of a large contingent of Catalan volunteers in the ranks of the French army. The initiative um, was, was promoted by Catalanist political group uh, Unió Catalanista and the periodical Iberia, uh, a weekly publication in support of the Allies that was published in Barcelona in the years between 15 and 19. Uh, through their propaganda, they aim to gain credence with the French public opinion and overtly distance themselves from the neutral position opted by the Spanish monarchy during the conflict. In Roussillon, they found a loyal supporter in the Revue Catalane, uh, which was, uh, which was the, the periodical published by the Société d'Etudes Catalane, which echoed this message. After the war, the regionalist enthusiasm that motivated the young Catalanists found expression in Renaissance Catalane. Journal, uh, Journal littéraire français catalan, régionaliste sportive, uh, which was founded in July 18, uh, 1918. From, the, uh, from its earliest issues, it undertook an active campaign in favor of administrative and economic decentralization of France, and consequently the abolition of artificial departments to make place for regions. <laughs> The new periodical uh, stood out in the Roussillon panorama for some of its editors' position in favor of a Catalan nationalist cause. In particular, it paid specific attention to the campaign for Catalan autonomy. According to La Renaissance Catalane, the disruptive reawakening of nationalities that the war had brought to light was the result of centuries of European policy that had been pursued without regard for the will of the people. Nonetheless, the stance in favor of the Catalan national question was, provo was provoked by the events that had marked the Four Years' War. These events were observed and judged through the filter of the French patriotism, since the periodical content for the Spaniards had its origins in neutrality proclaimed by the Spanish crown during the Great War. Whereas, on um, Ba, 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 ba. Whereas on the battlefront, thousands of vol Catalan volunteers lost their lives in the name of I put the periodical highest ideals of justice and freedom. Yeah, say thousands. Yeah. In an ideological conflict that did not accept neutral faction, the Spanish attitude appeared morally unacceptable. All things considered, the Catalanism of La Renaissance did not go beyond an unconditional support to claims for autonomy of Catalonia as a simple manifestation of an ancient brotherhood. The Rossoonianist Catalanists indeed had no political claims, if not an administrative and cultural reform within the French state. Yet, even, uh, even if the Roussillon uh, regionalists abstain from any political activity in France, they nonetheless, uh, they nonetheless took sides in Spanish affairs up until the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. La Colla del Roussillon and Le Jeu Fleuro du Genet d'Or were two cultural um, activities. I mean, <laughs> that um, arose uh, after the war. Uh, Colo de Roussillon, I mean, promoted uh, local and poets and artists, preserved the cults of tradition and Catalan. I mean, there, there was no political issue in, in that. <laughs> in addition to strengthening the, the links between the Petite et Grand Patrie, the Great War contributed to making Roussillon people more aware of their cultural and linguistic specificity within the French state and Occitan territories as well. Regionalists demanded the right to preserve their language and maintain their ancient customs and traditions. They also demanded an, administ an administrative reform and intellectual, cultural, economic, and social regionalism. They were not separatists, since uh, les Catalans du Roussillon aiment la France tout court à l'égal de leur petite patrie. Although they were very, uh, they were proud and respectful of the harmonious unity of their great homeland, they deprecated its excessive centralism, which had declared war to the traditional institution and had dealt a harsh blow in the, to the intellectual and cultural life of the provinces. Uh, the man in the photograph is uh, Marshal Joseph Joff, who won the battle on 
Marna in, uh, in September. Um, in September uh, 14, and uh, he, he was born in Rives Altes, uh, near Perpignan, and so made Roussignol people to be um, French uh, as well, Catalan, uh, to, uh, to, to have uh, French and Catalan origin as well. So the, the gal this galvanized uh, a sort of patriotism, uh, a French and Catalan patriotism. <coughs> French Flanders, yeah. The origins of the nationalist regionalist movement in the region of Flesh, uh, Flemish language in France uh, can be traced to the resistance of the majority of parish clergy and local Catholic nobility to the secularization policies implemented by the French state. In 1853, Edmond de Cosemacher founded the Comité Flamand de France. Uh, as a Société Savante, its aim was, among others, to study and disseminate Flemish culture and Catholic religion throughout the region. The association soon extended its activities to history, archaeology, and local folklore. Uh, the war had a profoundly unsettling, unsettling effect on, the French Flanders, on French Flanders, which was crossed by the Easter Front. As they were in France, the war galvanized a national fervor and unity and fomented the French patriotism. As in Roussillon, it also helped to mitigate the conflict between the church and the state, which was particularly animated within the committee. After the war, French Flanders adopted a pragmatic uh, approach and put pressure on the French government to seek compensation for the war damage from Germany <laughs> to be able to proceed to the reconstruction of the region. In this context, the main concern of the members of the committee after the war were now the reconstruction, maintenance of scientific level, and independence from Belgium. Uh, the, the consolidation of the Fédération Régionaliste Française in the region gave rise to different regionalist periodicals, such as, for example, Le Beffroi de Flandre or the Mercure de Flandre. Uh, in the interwar period, several new Flaming Hand organizations were founded and renewed efforts to promote Flemish culture were made. Uh, the Flemish circle newly created hoped to spread knowledge of Flanders through literature and history and the defense of Flemish language. In 1924, uh, the, Union, the Union des Cercles Flamands de France was founded under the presidency of the priest Jean-Marie Gantois, the man in the photograph. It brought together a few clerical circles and would publish a Flemish periodical and launch the campaign to advocate preaching and teaching in Dutch at primary schools. In July uh, 26, the Union uh, decided to change its name into Union Flamande de France, breaking with its strictly uh, clerical orientation and opening Flemish regionalism to lay people. It attracted Camille Lawton, uh, who was the, president's, uh, the president of the Comité uh, since uh, 1899, and Nicolas Bourgeois, uh, leader of the, de la Fédération, and joined the regionalist movement by associating itself with the Fédération Régionaliste Française. The activists of the Union launched two new periodicals, uh, Terre Vacter and Le Lyon de Flandre, uh, focus on the dissemination of Dutch culture and language and establish new contacts with the Breton, Alsatian, Occitan and Belgian Flemish nationalists. It began an ideological evolution that results in the movement proclaiming its nationalist vocation in the 1930, period during which the Pan-Dutch League gave financial support to the Union publication. publication. As for, the other, um, for other French regions, the situation was more or less the same. For instance, after the war, Occitanian associations that were willing to free themselves from the obsolete and the political philippe spirit uh, were created in Marseille, Montpellier, and Toulouse. In 1922, some young Philippe read a federalist declaration at Mistral's tomb. Uh, Mistral was the founding father, the founding father, and the poet, um, the founding father of Philippe, uh, which was. Um, um, a culture, a linguistic, a linguistic movement in um, or, which promoted the the, 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 man, uh, the maintaining the preservation uh, of um, of, um, of a province. And so, uh, the Philip Bridge was, was created in 1854 uh, uh, in uh, Ma, um, Mayan, Mayan, no Mayan, Mayan. Uh, but near Arla, I mean in, in province, uh, uh, Fonsegunia. 
you know, where, where it is exactly. But don't, um, he read the Federalist Declaration at Mistral Tomb that anticipated the, crea the creation of the Comité d'Action de Revendication Nationale du Midi, which in turn was the prelude to the foundation of the Ligue de la Patrie Méridionale, Fédération des Pays d'Oc, in 1923. This committee was made up of uh, several smaller committees responsible for the, uh, drawing up a federalist program. Within it, uh, the Ligue pour la langue d'oc à l'école was perhaps the only commission that existed in, existed in practice. With its federalist mission, the Ligue de la Patrie Méridionale uh, worked on the restoration of the Occitan language by promoting the creation of an Institut de the Occitan sustaining the publication of manuals and contributing to the establishment of an Occitan library. Ultimately, it was doomed to failure. Its main advocates, Camille Soula and Ismail Girard, published the periodical OCC since 23, which fought hard to give impetus to the Occitan culture and build a modern Occitan movement by breaking away from the Philip Bridge traditionalism and provincialism. It was deeply influenced by Catalanism, as were numerous other Occitan ventures of the interwar period. Indeed, Catalan-Occitan relationships resumed soon after the end of the war. During the 30s, the connection between Occitanism and Catalanism flourished. The Société d'Etudes Occitanes, uh, founded in Toulouse in 1930, was greatly inspired by Barcelona. Louis, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, Louis Alibert Grammatica Occitana, was published in 1935 in Barcelona. The Occitanist movement was partially founded by the Catalanist movement. <clears throat> Breton regionalism was politicized to a greater extent. The Breton movement was founded much earlier uh, since its nationalistic claims dated back to before the outbreak uh, of the war. Sorry. However, it had very limited uh, social roots. The war represented an important break for the history of the Breton movement. In 1919, uh, the group uh, Regionalist Breton, uh, which was founded an, a, an year earlier, uh, started publishing a bilingual Breton periodical, Braids at Our, uh, Bretagne Toujours. In May 1920, some activists uh, from the group, uh, Regionalist Breton, founded the Union de la Jeunesse Bretonne that comprised individuals from different political backgrounds, radicals, communists, Catholics, paganists, all of whom were reunited under the banner of Breton nationalism, and the majority of whom were French-speaking coming from Upper Brittany. Uh, this, this, uh, um, this is another characteristic um, of the regionalist uh, movement in France. Um, regionalists uh, at the end of the century and the beginning of the 20th century were, um, were mainly predominantly uh, French speaking. I mean, uh, they praised the, the they praised the value of the, of the, of the vernacular uh, language, but they wrote and um, they spoke in French, in, Fran in French, yeah. Up until 1941, the instigator of the movement was Morvan Marshall, a committed federalist. In Breza Tao, he exposed the theoretical foundations of a national movement, for him interlaid in federalism. As he wrote in 1925, nous ne serions hésiter, le nationalisme breton est fédéraliste. In June 1926, uh, Breza Tao published the Alsatia Manifesto of the Heimat Bonn. I hope my pronunciation is good. Homeland Union. And they changed it, its sub subtitle from Revue Mensuelle du Nationalisme Breton et des Relations Interceltiques, monthly magazine of the Breton Nationalism and the Interceltic Relations, into Revue Mensuelle du Nationalisme Breton et du Federalisme International, monthly magazine of the Breton Nationalism and the International Federalism. After the war, the idea of liberating peoples was not only stimulated and propagated by Wilsonianism, but also the influence of the Irish and, to a lesser extent, Welsh nationalists, considered as sister nations, who had a strong impact on the evolution of the group of regionalism. Celticist members of Reza Tau sought to redefine the place of Brittany, the place of, uh, the place of Brittany within the supranational community of Celtic nations by consolidating relations with the Welsh nationalists. Between 1950, uh, 1923 and uh, 25, Tao published a supplement with uh, articles in Welsh and English, Panceltia, that soon launched the idea of founding a nationalist party of Gauls. 
Nonetheless, it was especially the political electoral success of autonomous Alsatians from 1925 onwards that stimulated the Breton nationalist group to found a new, part, a new party, the Parti Autonomie Breton, which was uh, yet another push to, for federalism, the constituent congress for which took place in Rosporden in September 1927. We have a, we have a photo of, the, of this congress. That same year, Comité Central de Minorité Nationale de France was founded in Kemper. It brought together some delegates of Alsatian, Corsican, and Breton movements. It was the first time that various minor minorities met to study a common solution to their <laughs> problems and try to lay the foundation of a transformation of France into a federal country. Uh, yet, due to the 19 crisis, uh, 1929 crisis uh, and the resurgence of internal political tensions, federalism was uh, made a little headway. This splitting up of the Parti Autonomiste Breton in 1931 uh, led to the abandonment, abandonment, abandonment sorry, <laughs> of the federalist claims in favor of separatism. The 20s were um, uh, characterized the 20s were characterized by the return of peace and the gradual relaxation of international tensions, which favored the renaissance of people that for generations had been sil silenced by the aftermath of competing imperialism. The rise of fascism, which was to become evident from 1945, uh, smothered any possibility of federalism and the liberation of the minority peoples within the French state. Regional would make a comeback under the Vichy regime, but completely empty of its substance and reduced to the reactionary themes of return to the land and renaissance the province. The province. The province. <coughs> the Walloons, very quickly. The Walloon movement uh, became politicized in the last two decades of the 19th century, with a foundation of movement to defend Walloon and French-speaking culture and traditions following the introduction of the first linguistic laws promoting the Flemish language in the 1870s. During its early years, Walloon movement was neither interested in separatism, nor federalism, nor regional autonomy. It defended Belgium as a whole. But the situation started changing from 1911 on. That year, a law aiming at making the University of Ghent, Flamingon, contributed to radicalize the position of the movement. Not to mention that Walloons were practically excluded from the central powers and that the Flanders uh, took advantage of the Walloon in industrial wealth. During the Walloon Congress of 1912, organized by uh, the League of Wallon de Liège, a committee was set up to analyze the question of splitting from the national government. Committed, uh, it was the Committee d'Action Wallonne. And then an official Wallon parliament was instituted, the Assemblée Wallonne, which amended for developing propaganda on Wallon's matters. Sorry. The experience of war, of the war pushed, uh, pushed the Assemblée Wallonne to adopt a Belgian nationalist attitude, which caused uh, resentment among the recalcitrant and radical Wallonians. <coughs> In the aftermath of the war, the Comité d'Action Wallonne, which reunited more radical activists, resumed its activity. Even though it participated in the debates of the Assembly, uh, a certain degree of divergence soon appeared. The radicalization of the young militants provoked a, sh a schism between the Comité d'Action Wallonne of Liège and the Assemblée Wallonne. The Ligue d'Action Wallonne, established in Liège in 1923, was a federalist association that sought to bring together all those associations who fight for a greater degree of regional autonomy. Until 1940, it defended unilingualism in Wallonia and bilingualism in Flanders. Among its main concerns were the questions of rapprochement with France, the Walloon representation of the government, the economic interests of the Walloons, the demographic problem, the linguistic right of the, of the Walloons in the official bodies, and the statutes of the linguistic border of Brussels. The Ligue d'Action Wallonne organized Le Congrès de la Concentration Wallonne from 1940 onwards, at the inaugural Congress, uh, which was held in Liège in September 1940, with the aim of bringing together the various leaning uh, within the Wallon movement. A resolution was adopted to, that emphasized the French integrity of Wallonia and acknowledged that the Flemish people were entitled to their own identity. <coughs> the last case, Austa Valle. 
Uh, until the war, the linguistic rights of the French-speaking population of Aosta Valley uh, were principally defended by the clergy and certain ranks of the middle classes. In 1909, uh, Ansel Rehan founded the Ligue Val d'Autaine with a photograph of um, the Constituent uh, Congress and of uh, Ansel Rehan, the Ligue Val d'Autaine, whose purpose was to defend the official character of the teaching of the French language. It represented the temporary effort of going beyond ideological and political divergences, in particular between Catholic and liberals, in the name of the common ideal of preserving the linguistic and cultural identity of Aosta Valley. It was the first movement to open the debate about the respect for minorities and the need to grant the Aosta Valley, uh, to, uh, to grant Aosta Valley a special status. A status. In October 1913, Monsignor Le the photo, founded a weekly publication, Le Pays d'Aost, with the purpose of preserving the moral and religious virtues as well as their traditions and the French language of the region. In the post-war period, the issue of linguistic minorities in Italy was prominent. If the numbers of families of foreign extraction in, in Italy had not been particularly uh, high prior to the war, uh, Accessions uh, subsequent to the war led to the arrival of more than a half a million of new allogloss subjects. Hence, the question of minorities became part of mainstream political and cultural debate in Italy. <clears throat> in this context, the, the Ligue Val d'Autaine was given renewed impetus. In the years immediately following the war, ethnic reasons were put forward to advocate the specificity of Aosta Valley, both in the documents of the League and the local press. This radicalization was partly justified by the fear that the government would grant a special status to the German and Slovenian minorities, but considered to be ethnically diverse, but not to Aosta Valley. At the same time, the Aosta Valley elite opposed any attempts by the government to equate them to the context of newly annexed populations. In an article published on Le Pays d'Aost, de Venin, Explained, uh, explained that to compare the Aosta Valley question with one of the territories of German and Slovenian languages offended the patriotism demonstrated uh, by Aosta Valley uh, during the conflict. It was in this context that the League began to advance more political claims. In 1919, the League presented some claims for autonomy in a petition addressed to the Italian minister Orlando, who was the president... Yeah, um, uh, who was the president of the Council of the Ministers and of the Italian delegation to the Congress of Peace in Paris. This memorandum, which was called Petition pour les revendications ethniques et linguistiques de la Val d'Aoste, attempted to internationalize the Aosta Valley question and made a specific, specific reference to the rights of its people to self-determination. Indeed, these claims were fomented by the Wilsonian 14-point plan, as well as the consciousness, uh, 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 sorry, as well as the concession by the Italian government to the German-speaking minority in the South Tyrol. Nevertheless, they did not go beyond stacking their linguistic <laughs> claims, making a timid proposal for administrative autonomy and requesting the opening of a French consulate in Aosta. Uh, well, I jump to conclusion because... <laughs> Oh, 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 mm, mm, mm. No, sto tornando indietro, è geniale. Conclusion. conclusion, some conclusion. The European political landscape of the post-war period come to terms with an absolutely new phenomenon, namely the geographical spread of a nationalist and regionalist movement. <laughs> Among the factors identified as contributing to this phenomenon and that were closely related to the resolution, uh, resolution imposed by the treaties and their ideological implication, at least two are worthy of mention. First of, all, first of all, the creation of the legally new problem of national minorities, amounting to 25, 40 million individuals, that is 25-25% uh, 20, of the total population of the new states. Secondly, the validation de facto of the principle of national self-determination, especially among the victorious powers. Indeed, among the most serious consequences of the introduction of the principle of self-determination was the emergence and the strengthening of nationalist and regionalist movements, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Western Europe. 
combined with the international legitimization of the principle of nationality to serve the interests of negotiating and sustaining a durable peace. The expectation created by the peace conference pushed nationalist movement to embark upon a series of propagandist activities and political actions aimed at influencing the decision of negotiators. We, we saw this uh, yesterday. In the cases I have dealt with, the repercussions of the principle of self-determination were principally uh, cultural and linguistic. While the principle of self-determination galvanized local identities, the effort that the war had required in all, this in all the countries involved in it, in my case, uh, in this case, in France, in Italy, but also in Belgium, strengthened state patriotism. France, for example, entered the war compact and united, and few demonstrations of dissent were held. L'Union Sacrée prevailed over the scarce and dissonant voices, calling for wills to be un united in the common effort to fight for the liberation of the amputated national territory. In such a context, the principle of self-determination contributed to reawakening or galvanizing national or regional consciousness, giving legitimacy to cultural and linguistic claims that occasionally resulted in minor, uh, minor political demands. As rightly observed by uh, Professor, Professor Nunez Seixas, the situation of propagandistic use of the principle of nationality and the dissemination of Wilsonian meat, as well as, uh, as well as the attempted international legitimization of the right to self-determination, exercise uh, great influence over the evolution toward nationalism of various groups uh, which had previously concentrated on cultural activities or whose ideological definition was formulated in a regionalist or federalist way. Nonetheless, I would add, in the immediate uh, aftermath of the war, neither regionalism nor federalism were in principle opposed to the unitary conception of the state that had taken foothold among this micronationalism. Thank you for your attention.